12 o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. So I want to start out by thanking all of our viewers out there. Welcome you all to the first ever Medical Student Grand Rounds. I am Bryce Ringwald. I'm a fourth year medical student and vice president of student council. A medical student Grand Rounds started out as an idea a little over a year ago by current third year medical student Phil Wozniak to develop a lecture series that would be meaningful to medical students. We originally had big dreams to bring in big names like Atul Gawande and J.D. Vance, among with others. And then we realized how much speaking fees were. So we went back to the drawing boards. And then I was walking through Myling Hall one day when I thought about all the amazing achievements of medical students in the College of Medicine that happen every single day. So myself, Phil, and Christina Witcher, another fourth year medical student in the MSDP program, began to create a lecture series by medical students for medical students that not only highlights the presenter's achievements, but infuses passion and inspires other medical students. This series will be a continuous event occurring in the first and third Tuesday of the month, starting at 12 p.m. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the series will continue via a virtual webinar-based platform until it is deemed safe for large groups to return to the lecture halls of Myling Hall. Today, we have a fantastic presentation lined up for you, with you all, uh, with Corey Thompson, fourth year medical student, who will be presenting on the importance of diversity in medicine and about the progress uh, the pipeline program he founded as a first year medical student, heads up, has had in fixing the uh, leaky pipeline. In two weeks from now, on October 20th, we will be hearing from Monir Abeljoud, who will be presenting on combating the stigmatization of men's health. And then on November 3rd, we will be uh, hearing from Janice Bonzu. She's a fourth year medical student. Talk about her time as a member of the Ohio State University Board of Trustees, leadership, and how her collective experiences have shaped her career path. But before we hand over the presentation to Dr. Gray for our introduction for today's speaker, I wanted to ask that viewers use the QR code found here and take an opportunity to nominate a potential speaker for our lecture series. These can be self nominations or you can nominate someone else. We want to represent medical students across all classes who are doing amazing things and give them the opportunity to present and inspire their peers. In addition, we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. And we ask that viewers utilize the Q&A function uh, in the bottom of their screen in order to ask their questions. And now without further ado, I wanna thank Dr. Gray for being here today to introduce one of his many mentees, and today's speaker, Corey Thompson. Thank you for that, Bryce. Um, it's truly an honor to participate in this inaugural event, especially because I get to introduce student Dr. Corey Thompson. I've had the pleasure of knowing um, student Dr. Thompson since before he was a medical student. Um, and certainly it was an honor to um, be his preceptor for LP, longitudinal practice, uh, when he first started uh, coming into the clinic. Unfortunately, I couldn't convince him uh, to pursue a career in gastroenterology via his experience uh, in my clinic, but I'm honored that he chose um, uh, radiology as an aspiration and, and will undoubtedly be an outstanding uh, radiologist uh, in the future. You know, it's one of the highlights of my career, not only has been kind of being a card-carrying fan club member uh, for, for uh, student Dr. Corey's uh, fan club, um, but really has been being able to participate in some of the, the programming that he has launched, uh, some of which he'll talk about today, particularly with the Heads Up program. Uh, I am really enamored with the trajectory of, of Corey, um, and I encourage all students who are watching really to pick up on some of the pearls that he's going to drop in this talk today, uh, but just to try to emulate uh, some of the patterns that he has developed over time and what he has truly exhibited in my relationship with him is really a truly a great mentor-mentee relationship. Without further ado, I'm really happy to have a student Dr. Corey Thompson to present. And following his presentation, I encourage you to, or during his presentation actually, you can submit questions using the Q&A function. The chat function is disabled, but you can issue questions. I can't promise that I'll get to all of your questions, 
but I will be reviewing questions to present to student Dr. Thompson at the end of his presentation. Dr. Thompson? Wow. Um, well, hello. Uh, hello, Dr. Gray. Hello, Bryce. Um, hello, faculty, peers, uh, students, uh, family members, and, and everyone else who has uh, decided to tune in today. I am truly humbled at the opportunity uh, to be able to speak to you all um, about something, a topic that, that holds a very special place in my heart. Um, and I hope to, you know, through our conversation today, uh, impose upon you all its importance in modern day healthcare and medical education. And so uh, the title of my talk today is Fixing the Leaky Pipeline, Why Diversity in Medicine Matters. Um, you can see my name there as well as my Twitter handle. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, and yeah, so uh, a quick background on me. Uh, as Dr. Gray pointed out, I'm a fourth year interested in, in radiology, gearing up for ERAS as we speak. Uh, I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, so happy to be home for medical school. I uh, went to UK for undergrad, go Big Blue. Uh, and this is really my passion. Uh, I, I love talking about and um, creating, implementing plans to tackle health disparities, uh, mainly through exposure, through education and mentorship. And you'll see that permeate throughout our talk today, specifically when we speak about Heads Up and in our work here at uh, Ohio State College of Medicine. So our agenda for today, uh, the major topics that, that we'll be talking about. Um, first, you know, why we march? Why are we talking about this? Next, we'll, we'll tackle the idea of structural competency and its importance. We'll speak on heads up and the leaky pipeline. And lastly, we will uh, I'll open it up for questions that you all might have uh, at the end. A couple of learning objectives for, for our lecture today. Uh, I hope that, that uh, through our conversation, you'll be able to better define and identify the concept of structural inequities within healthcare. Uh, discuss the importance of structural competency amongst healthcare workers. Identify how the physician has played a role in the advancement of certain structural inequities. To understand the concept of the leaky pipeline and develop solutions to address the lack of diversity in medicine. And uh, those are our four main topics, but, but hopefully, hopefully this is just the beginning and, and you're able to sort of build off these throughout uh, our discussion today. But without any further ado, uh, let's get into this. Why we march? Why is this the problem? Uh, and what are we gonna do about it? And let's focus in on some prior research uh, topics in order to, to get into that. So there was an article, uh, a research article that came out in September of 2018. Uh, it's out of Oakland titled, Does Diversity Matter for Health? Um, it was picked up by a variety of journal articles, um, news websites, social media, et cetera. And what this study did was they studied the effect of diversity in the physician workforce uh, versus the demand of preventative care for African-American men. And, and African-American black men in this country have the lowest life expectancy of any major demographic group here in the US. And, and much of this disadvantage is due to chronic diseases that are amenable to both primary and secondary prevention. And so, and so what this article did, it was a field experiment in which they randomized black men uh, to black or non-black male doctors. And uh, they used a two-stage design to measure these black men's decisions regarding cardiovascular screening and the flu vaccine, both before they were introduced to their, their physician and after they were introduced to their physician. And what results showed were that black men are much more likely to select every preventative service, particularly invasive services, uh, once meeting a doctor who is of their same race. Uh, these effects were very pronounced in, in males who had very little experience uh, in the medical field or who suggested that they had a mistrust within the medical field. Uh, and, and the results are most consistent with, with better patient-doctor communication during the encounter uh, rather than discrimination or measures of doctor's quality or effort or other uh, measures that were used. Uh, in the end, the findings suggested 
that black doctors could help reduce cardiovascular mortality by 16 deaths per 100,000 per year, leading to a 19% reduction in the black white male gap in cardiovascular mortality. So we're saving lives, we're saving healthcare dollars. All in all, it's a big yes. Whatever way you wanna spit it, whatever language you wanna say it in, the answer was yes. But uh, let's, let's focus in a little more closely. This is just one example. Let's take it a little closer to home, for me at least. Here's another article that came out this summer actually, titled Physician-Patient Racial Concordance and Disparities in Birthing Mortality for Newborns. And this, this article went absolutely viral. It was picked up by CNN, the Washington Post. It flooded social media out, outlets. And they explored racial concordance in, in a setting where racial disparities are particularly severe, that being childbirth, where here in the United States, black newborns die at three times the rate of white newborns. And I'll say that again, black newborns here in the United States die at three times the rate of their white counterparts. And so what this study did was it examined 1.8 million hospital births in the state of Florida between the years of 1992 and 2015. And their study sh suggested that newborn physician racial concordance, or in other words, a black physician taking care of a black newborn was associated with a significant improvement in mortality for black infants. The results further suggest that these benefits manifest themselves more during challenging births and in, and in hospitals that deliver more black babies. And so let me explain, you know, the numbers are great, but let me explain why this is important by adding a little bit of context to the story. Here we have a picture of a beautiful black woman. Her name is Camille. Uh, and this, this picture was taken when she was about two thirds into her first pregnancy. Uh, and around this time, she started to feel a little bit uneasy. Something just wasn't right. Uh, she began having headaches, uh, some nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. And so Camille decided to go to the emergency department and was told that her symptoms were consistent with pregnancy, uh, that she should not worry about it too much, but return if, uh, if they get any worse. Uh, but that, that just didn't sit right with Camille. And so she went ahead and called her ob who was a black physician by the name of Augustus Parker. Um, Gus Parker immediately told her to come into the hospital uh, right over Mount Carmel East. Um, and upon entering the hospital, Camille's symptoms rapidly worsened. Uh, she became anemic, hypertensive, uh, elevated liver enzymes, med students out there, I know the buzzwords are screaming and you're absolutely correct. Uh, Camille had gone into HELP syndrome, preeclampsia. Uh, and Dr. Parker correctly identified this and performed an emergency C-section um, where both Camille and her son uh, successfully recovered. Um, her son's name was Corey, and um, Dr. Parker would remain a mentor in Corey's, or I guess I should say life, uh, for, for years and years to come. Uh, some 25 years later, um, I would attend medical school at The Ohio State University with the help of Dr. Parker. Um, as a fourth year, give my first ever Grand Rounds talk where I asked Dr. Parker, uh, and I believe he's listening in, if, if he would hood me uh, in, a, in a couple of months as I become the first medical doctor in my family. And so this experience, is, it's more about the numbers. It's more than the numbers. Uh, we can even point to the department chair of family medicine. It's not just me, but Dr. Nwando Oliwalu shared a similar story in a talk uh, earlier this summer um, about her own experience. Um, this, ladies and gentlemen, is why diversity matters in medicine. It's about hope, it's about opportunity, and in this case, it is quite literally about life and death. But let's, uh, let's take a step back and look at it from a, from a 3,000 foot view and really analyze life expectancy here in the United States versus the health expenditure over time. And here, as you can see uh, via the, the red delineated data points that the US, although we spend an exorbitant amount of money on our healthcare system, we do not 
uh, get the, the outcomes that we might expect or hope for, especially when compared to other countries such as Japan or Switzerland. And you can point to, to many factors. Uh, you know, certainly the United States are much larger, is a much larger country than many of these. But, but I think that any way you spin it, we're clearly not optimizing our system. We're not getting out of it what we should. And so when we analyze the major contributors to morbidity and mortality in the United States, we come up with the following list. Poor birth outcomes, which we, we briefly touched upon, injuries and homicides, heart disease, diabetes, chronic lung disease, disability, adolescent pregnancy, HIV and AIDS, and drug-related deaths, all of which are preventable diseases. The University of Wisconsin took this a step further and um, looked at modifiable determinants of health, uh, so, so factors excluding genetics, and uh, came up with a, a sort of pie chart uh, percentage of what our patients are experiencing um, that, that is adversely affecting their health. And I, and I purposely blurred out the pie chart just to give you all an opportunity to, to think for yourselves as, as to where you think these fall, what percentage do the social and economic factors, health behaviors, clinical health care, and physical environment factors play a role in our health. And so what the study found were the following numbers. SES, or socioeconomic status, or factors, and health behaviors being the majority contributing factors, while the others follow uh, with clinical health care and physical environmental factors. And this was, this was surprising to me. Um, I was kind of, I had a hard time thinking it wasn't 25, 25, 25, 25. Um, and when you, when we as physicians think about social and economic factors or health, our, our patients' health behaviors, that seems like a lot to tackle. And I completely agree with you. It's almost you know, an insurmountable cause. It's impossible to conquer everything that's encompassed within SES and individualized patient behaviors. But I would like you all for a second to just focus on that 20%, that clinical health care where, where we are really in our element. That's our wheelhouse. And I, I suggest to you all that Physician decisions within this realm in the past have, have negatively affected that 40% and 30%, that SES and that health behaviors. And furthermore, that we can do actionable items now that will eliminate that 20%, that clinical health care, and subsequently spill over to, to sort of begin to mend those larger complex inequities that fall within social and economic factors, as well as health behaviors of our patients. And, I'll, and I wanna um, you know, really focus in on that in the next sort of uh, couple of slides of the talk, explain to you all what I mean by that. When we look at inequities within healthcare, we see some of the following facts. We see that black patients experience worse health outcomes due to inadequate healthcare access. We can look at breast cancer screening in black women or colon cancer in black men or the infant mortality example that I mentioned earlier. Additionally, we know that diversity within the medical field fails to reflect the diversity of our patient population. Here at Ohio State, we're, we're taught that uh, from the very beginning through, through lectures with Dr. Capers, with Dr. Gray, and et cetera. And truly, I think we do a great job at, at beginning to fix this, but, but there is undoubtedly work to be done. We also know that physician training does not protect against nor adequately address implicit and explicit biases. It's not that all of a sudden that you have an MD or a DO behind your name that the biases that shaped your character for the years prior disappear. It's not, that's not what happens. And so we need to be more intentional about addressing and, and um, appropriately uh, teaching how to guard ourselves from these biases. And these next two points are really where I wanna focus on. The first being that physician biases lead to inaccurate diagnoses, the perpetuation of social stigma or stereotypes, and the bolstering 
of structural institutions that disadvantage minority populations. Additionally, physicians must be more structurally competent to better treat our patients. And so here's where we get into the interesting part. What is this idea of structural competency? And so earlier this year, uh, before COVID times, I was able to attend a talk uh, by, by Dr. Ryan Huerto, um, who did an amazing job and he, he has an amazing social media presence really. Um, thank you all should follow him at Dr. Huerto. And during that talk, he explained uh, this book uh, and, and the idea of structural competency and, and how he understood it. And I wanted to pull out a, a quick excerpt for you all. Structural competency radically departs from these biological and cultural approaches by contending that many health related factors previously attributed to culture or ethnicity also represent the downstream consequences of decisions about larger structural contexts, including healthcare and food delivery systems, zoning laws, local politics, urban and rural infrastructures, structural racisms, or even the very definitions of illness and health. Healthcare providers need to be more competent at recognizing and addressing the upstream structural factors that determine patients' health and create health inequities. The article goes on to say that structural competency is revolutionary. It not only addresses the negative impact of structural inequalities of health, but forges a path to undo medicine support for an unjust social order. And so allow me to provide you all with some examples out of the AMA Journal of Ethics uh, by, the, by the same writers, uh, Dorothy Roberts and Dr. Jonathan Metzl. And the case I wanna focus in on is the overdiagnosis of schizophrenia to provide you all the framework of what I mean, or what we mean by structural competency. And so from the 60s, 1960s to the 80s, we saw an uptick uh, in insanity afflicting African-American men, or so it seemed to mental health researchers at the time. In 1969, a, a series uh, by the National Institute of Mental Health uh, found that Blacks suffered from schizophrenia 65% more frequently than did whites. And in 1973, a series in the uh, archives of general psychiatry discovered that African-American patients were, quote, significantly more likely than white patients to receive schizophrenia diagnosis and significantly less likely than white patients to receive diagnosis for other mental illnesses, such as depression or bipolar. And this trend continued through the 70s and 80s, uh, where we saw African-American men five to seven times more likely to be diagnosed with the paranoid subtypes of schizophrenia than their white counterparts. And this, this really flew in the face of standard psychiatric understanding in which they correctly understood that most major psychiatric disorders occur, occur equally among all persons, regardless of race. And so, you know, what they did was, was really revolutionary, um, especially at this time, but, but they, they began to examine their data uh, and, and thinking that this was a result of physician bias, they started to create uh, implicit bias trainings, cross-cultural initiatives to eliminate the bias. However, this was a largely unsuccessful attempt. And so now we ask why? And when we look back at it, we recognize that the misdiagnosis of schizophrenia resulted not just from clinical bias, which certainly could have been there, but from structural shifts in the psychiatric definition of the illness. For instance, prior to the 1960s, psychiatry defined schizophrenia as a psychological reaction to a splitting of the basic function of personality. And in 1952, when they were drafting the first edition for the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which for those of you who may not know, helps us to define psychiatric illnesses, they described the schizophrenic reaction as emotional disharmony, unpredictable disturbances in stream of thought. It was known as a regressive behavior. And with this framing, we saw 
that the condition mainly afflicted middle-class white housewives. And until that time, mainstream American newspapers described schizophrenia as an illness that, that occurred in seclusive, sensitive persons. Uh, we were told of schizophrenic poets, and it was almost romanticized uh, in, in cartoon depictions of Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde. However, in 1968, right before we, or during when we saw this uptick, the second edition of the DSM came out and they recast the paranoid schizophrenic as a condition of hostility, aggression, or projected anger that included text explaining that the patient's attitude is frequently hostile and aggressive and his behaviors tend to be consistent with his delusions, all right? And so this had huge racial implications. We think about it, 1968. I'm not sure about you all, but I can think of plenty of things to be angry about as a black male in this time. We had a whole civil rights movement going on. We had the murder, the assassination of many of our leaders in the community. And so this is a classic case of physicians not understanding, not reading the room, a lack of structural competency in knowing that the definition of schizophrenia at this time was by and large um, incorrect and resulting in the misdiagnosis based on uh, societal, based on uh, structural barriers and, and happenings in place. And so with this, they began uh, a slew of ads uh, and, and sort of social stigma that negatively impacted the black community, but also perpetuation of a negative stigma of mental health. And so this is one, one example. I really recommend you all check out the other examples provided in the article. There, there's a, a very riveting and, and disheartening example uh, that speaks on drug use and pregnancy and, and the variation in, in punitive repercussions, yes, punitive repercussions for black women versus white women. Uh, and, and a couple other examples, it, it's really, deep stuff. But, you know, let's not stop there. Yes, we have the problem, but how do we, how do we increase our structural competency? Where do we go from here? How can we be better now? And the article pointed out a couple examples. First and foremost, we must be skeptical of race-based differences in diagnoses. You know, if, if in a chart you're reading uh, black people or in lecture notes, black people are more likely to suffer from hypertension. Well, let's unpack that. Let's talk about racial disparities in where you live, food insecurity and food deserts, and the constant stresses that a lot of times plague these communities. We must create alliances between doctors and other professionals who serve the same vulnerable patients. We cannot do this alone. We must be creative in addressing extra clinical structural problems, something that we'll get into a little bit later. We must learn from social science and humanities disciplines, such as sociology, anthropology, Apology, history, and critical race theory to be more aware of ways racism is embedded in institutions and operates apart from blatant acts of individual bias. We must draw lessons from other professions that have taken active steps towards addressing structural racism. And last, and perhaps most importantly, in these times, we must speak up more vocally about structural issues that impact patients politically. And with that, I will go on a small tangent. The events of 2020 uh, have done nothing if not put a magnifying glass on problems that are hundreds of years in the makings. We can look at the COVID-19 death rates. We can look at voter suppression amongst uh, minority communities, food insecurities in these communities, and the death at the hands of public health officials, including police and judicial system sentencing. And so I urge you all, regardless of your political affiliation, that if you care about these topics, if you want to change these topics, please get out and vote. And with that being said, we enter our second to last topic, that being heads up in the leaky pipeline. And so the leaky pipeline is a structural barrier, uh, a structural competency, if you will, that physicians, especially in academia, must be aware of. And there are many reasons for its happening. Today, we, we see black men applying to medicine at lower rates 
than we saw in the 70s. And we have to understand why that happens. Additionally, we must understand that that does not stop at medical school. We see a downtick in residents and fellows of minority status. Additionally, those uh, kept on as attendings, specifically in academic facilities and academic faculty. And then furthermore, as we examine the leadership of these large academic institutions and that the percentage of minorities throughout every single step of these drops. And we must ask ourselves why. Why do these barriers exist? What can we do about them? Lack of mentorship, the contributions diver regarding diversity and inclusion, perhaps not as valuable as other uh, research contributions to the university or to the institution. The, the idea of kind of being the only one or a spokesperson for your entire race, it's a lot of pressure. Overt and covert biases, as well as imposter syndrome, uh, which we all deal with uh, in more ways than one. And I do just want to give a pick, quick plug to Drs. Brittany James and Brandy Jackson, who gave a talk on uh, a more extensive talk on the leaky pipeline uh, and their Med Like Me campaign, uh, another great uh, Twitter account and resource. And so with knowledge of this problem came the creation of Heads Up, which stands for Health Education and Development Services for Underprivileged Populations. We know that the lack of diversity in medicine compromises patient access, safety, and the quality of care. And so we propose that through enriching the pipeline of underrepresented minorities in medicine, we could improve this, uh, addressing the need for engagement uh, of specifically immigrant and refugees uh, into medical careers uh, was, was our true purpose in designing a program uh, focused on health education for youth ages 6 through 14 uh, with that goal of increasing medical knowledge and interest in higher education and health careers. And so it was truly all a dream, not, not to just quote Biggie, but this, uh, this was an idea that I had as a first year that, that some of my, my best friends, uh, Bell Perez and Brad Feldman, helped, helped me bring to fruition. Uh, we partnered with a local nonprofit known as ETSS that provides services for immigrant and refugee youth in, here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I had worked with their summer program for years and years prior to, uh, and so I developed a relationship with these children and, and noticed that they did not have a curriculum focused on, on health or, or medicine. And so what we did was we implemented ourselves into, into their summer camp program uh, twice weekly on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, for about two hours each day, creating separate lectures based on age group. We did 6th through 7th, 8th through 10th, 11 plus. Uh, and on Tuesdays, we really focused on teaching lectures, um, breaking it down for them. And that following Thursday, we would actually, as you can see in the, with these pictures, provide an interactive, uh, hands-on uh, activity to really allow these lessons to stick. Uh, we evaluated the students by pre and post testing them on medical knowledge, as well as by collecting objective feedback from both the kids as well as their families on how they felt uh, about the program. Did they notice anything different in their, in their children's passion? Uh, all of which were resounding yeses. And so in the end, we came up with the following mission and vision for Heads Up. We wanted to increase the amount of students from underprivileged communities pursuing a career in medicine, to increase awareness of one's own health, to increase medical knowledge and interest, to expose, empower, educate, and mentor. And this is now our third plus year of doing so. Let's take it back to the first year of Heads Up where we had our inaugur inaugural and annual partnership with the ETSS Youth Summer Program that I've spoken on. We had workshops with Columbus City School System uh, in which we more or less did the same thing uh, that happened in the, in the Youth Summer Program, but we partnered with fourth and fifth graders uh, in Columbus City Schools and actually brought them to the medical school campus uh, for shortened versions uh, of these same workshops. Uh, and additionally, perhaps most importantly, we established an available community health education project, CHE project 
for first year medical students at OSU so that this program continues long after we are gone into residency as attendings, um, really make this a staple uh, within the curriculum. And at the end of our first year, we came up with the following data. Um, what you might expect from, from first year medical students getting their feet wet in research projects. Uh, not the most extensive, however, we, our p-values suggested that we were seeing significant improvement uh, for many of our age groups. And so this provided us a framework to build upon, provided us with the confidence and sort of the leverage uh, that, that let us know that we could do this, we can build on this, uh, we can make this something great. And so we find ourselves on the second year. We again did the youth summer program. Uh, and most excitingly, we were invited to conduct our workshops at the LeBron James I Promise School uh, here in Akron, Ohio. And needless to say, we did much better with our data collection. And so when we look at our data, we, we analyzed that ages six through seven showed significant increases in their total test scores, first aid and substance abuse scores, and MSK scores. Additionally, Ages eight through 10 showed a significant increase in total test scores, MSK, cardiology, neurology, and careers, which was analyzed using a Likert scale. And our 11 plus could have, could have used a little work. They showed significant increase in nutrition. Uh, and while there were increases in other areas, they did not show a significant increase. In addition to this, our qualitative feedback suggested increased interest in medically related education, confidence in achieving mastery of medical knowledge, and desire for program continuance. So when we really look at this data, uh, we, we see that we did a great job, but, but there's, there's something lacking. There's something more that we could be doing. And while we as medical students certainly know the information we're teaching, it does not necessarily give us the qualifications to teach that information. And so next steps uh, have included partnering with the, the College of Education here at OSU so that we can uh, better our not only our teaching and our uh, preparation of the lectures, but also um, really look at how we're asking questions, um, how to best pre and post test the students so that we are really getting the best out of them. And now we're midway, a little over through um, the third year of Heads Up, which has presented itself with, with challenges, of course, with COVID and whatnot. Um, however, we kept the youth summer program going. We did it virtually this year. Uh, they did a great job. Thank you all so much to the first and second years who manned this. Um, you guys were awesome. And they're currently kind of crunching that data. Uh, they were very innovative in, in creating a medical school application resume workshop for underrepresented minorities who are pre-medical students here at Ohio State currently in discussion with Columbus City Schools, advocating for refinement of the systems to implement strategic efforts toward diversity, equity, inclusion, and even hosted the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Week uh, here at OSUCOM, and there's a fire for them. Again, amazing group of students. The future of Heads Up is so very bright, um, and I, I could not be more proud. And so, some takeaway points. Uh, before we open it up for questions in our, in our final slides. Our first point is that there are upstream structural barriers that negatively impact the health care provided to our patients. And these barriers disproportionately affect our minority communities. The lack of structural competency within the physician workforce can lead to misdiagnoses, the perpetuation of negative social stigma, and poorer health care outcomes. Structural competency should be requi a required component of medical education, similar to our other competencies. Uh, and, and this is really key in creating improved physician-patient relationships to developing those relationships uh, that will last many times throughout these patients' lives. The leaky pipeline describes a structural barrier for minorities throughout their medical careers. And it is up, up to us as physicians to dismantle these barriers, especially if you're involved in academia. And lastly, this is our lane and the time is now. We cannot wait any longer. I wanna give a special thank you to the people on this screen. Um, 
without you all, this would not be possible. Bell, Brad, Evan, Corey, uh, Rose, Phil, Torin, Brittany, Paige, Christina, Bryce, and Olivia, uh, Doctors Gray, um, Seleshi Asfa uh, at ETSS, uh, as well as Dr. Clinchot, uh, and, and many more, Drs. Greco, Drs. Pearson, uh, Dr. Quinn in Anatomy, Dr. Capers, uh, ETSS, the I Promise staff, Anthony, Meg, Noel, uh, Ben, everybody. It, it's, it's more than just me. Um, I have an amazing group of people that, that have empowered me uh, throughout this process. Uh, and I really just want to be sure to give them a shout out because without them, this would not be possible. And before we get to questions, I just want to leave you with, with a short clip uh, to, to sort of summarize why we care so much and why this is so important. Hey, thank you for coming today and letting us learn all these cool stuff about the brain and the heart. And you're really good people. I liked how y'all teach us today. It was one of my best, my best days ever at school. And thank you for helping me learn this much like I never learned. Awesome, Isaiah. Thank you, man. Thank you. And so, you know, Isaiah, Isaiah said it best. Um, we are inspiring the next generation of physicians. That is why diversity in medicine matters, so that we can continue this wave uh, continue to provide our patients with extraordinary health care. Um, and so I thank you all for listening. And at this point, uh, I will open it up for questions. Corey, congratulations and thank you for an outstanding presentation. Um, I think we are all better for it. And I'm honored to uh, lead us in to the Q&A period. And if you look in your Q&A function, Corey, you'll see a lot of uh, congrats and thank yous uh, for your amazing work, even a shout out for the, for the portrait you have behind you of John Lewis. Uh, clearly, you're getting into some good trouble um, here at The Ohio State University. I'll start off with a question from Elizabeth. Elizabeth asks, what organization should faculty engage with in order to improve the pipeline? For example, Local groups like Heads Up, like what you talked about, or national groups like LMSA or SNMA, Tour for Diversity. What are your thoughts? So, so in my opinion, there's certainly a need for both. Um, I do not think that Heads Up would have been able to do what we've done without the help of mentors such as Dr. Gray, uh, faculty leaders. Uh, and so I think that they were instrumental in our success. With that being said, it there is a need for physician engagement in these larger organizations. The LMSAs, the SNMAs, et cetera, um, do work similar to Heads Up and perhaps at even larger scales. And so absolutely there is a need. Um, for me personally, I, I'm, a, I'm a grassroots type of person. And so I would like to see more physician in, involvement in the smaller programs. Uh, I think that that students, specifically students that are from that area, have a particular uh, relationship with the community. And similar to Dr. Gray has pointed out, you know, there's a there's a vast difference between um, community engagement and uh, community service. And what we're looking for is community engagement. We're looking for the building of relationships uh, and longitudinal, um, you know, work that in which we can inspire the community, create leaders in the community. I just think it's, it's easier to do that with, with smaller sort of grassroots programs. Thank you. Marquise uh, points out that he's curious if, if the uh, people teaching Heads Up uh, were diverse. And if it was, do you think that there is a difference in the impact based off the race or ethnicity of the teachers? And if the teachers were not diverse, would you expect that to have an impact on the learners or for that to be different? Absolutely, uh, and great question. Uh, we were very uh, intentional in gathering student volunteers of diverse backgrounds, uh, ethnicities, races, specialties, um, really in every sense of the word. Uh, it was started you know, by, by myself, a black male, uh, Bell Perez, a, a Filipino female, and Brad Feldman, who is a white male. And we really worked 
to provide the, the students, meaning the, the younger uh, youth with, um, with people who looked like them, who talked like them, that they could relate to, that they could see themselves in, uh, because that makes all the difference. Uh, you, you don't know until you know, uh, you can't believe until you see. And so uh, we were very intentional about creating uh, a, a diverse experience for our youth. Um, and so, so yes, I do think it impacts their learning. Um, you know, it, it just provides a sense of familiarity and comfort for the students. A lot of these students have been through a lot. I mean, imagine being uh, in, in the example of the ETSS program, imagine being a refugee coming here from a country, uh, from your home country, and not really having that safety blanket, but being able to look up to someone uh, who, who shares some of your cultural experiences, who perhaps even shares a language with you uh, that, that is a, a student physician or even a physician. It, it, it just does wonders for them. Corey, I'm going to combine two questions, one from Shiraz, in, in which uh, they asked, what led you to choose a career uh, at, in radiology? Um, and then a second question from an anonymous attendee that says, how do you plan to make an impact during residency and as an attending? So I'll, I'll put a spin on that and saying, um, yes, give us some insight into, you know, your choice in choosing radiology uh, for residency and then how you hope to translate some of this work um, into your career, both as a trainee and ultimately as an attendee. Absolutely. Uh, both great questions. Uh, radiology is something that that came around for me uh, during my clinical year, so third year, uh, where I noticed that a lot of the decision making, uh, both surgical and medical, um, came from the radiologists. They were able to diagnose a problem using using imaging, uh, as well as correlating that with clinical findings, and that really drove the decision making as far as what we were going to do for that patient. And I, I liked being in that position. Um, I like figuring out what the problem is, addressing the problem for what it is, and then planning uh, subsequently. And, and I just felt uh, that, that because of that, um, radiology spoke to me. In addition to that, I, I have a variety of mentors uh, within that field. Uh, and there, there's a lot of good that can, that can come, uh, I think, from me uh, choosing to do to choose to do radiology as my career and getting to that second part of the question uh, with my with my background um, and expertise in health disparities, etc. I think that there's an opportunity for radiology to really examine uh, how our services are being uh, offered to patients across the board. Um, I, I spoke earlier how how black women are dying of breast cancer uh, at a very high rate, even though breast cancer in itself is more common in white women. When we look at why black women are dying, it's because they're diagnosed at later stages uh, due to missed imaging um, and missed care opportunities because of the lack of access to advanced imaging. And so we need to analyze you know, how we are, um, how access to imaging varies per zip code, per average household income in certain areas and the sort. And so I think that, that uh, I hope to fill that, that lane in radiology and um, in sort of uh, beginning to research and hopefully mitigate the barriers that exist uh, for our black patients uh, in getting access to imaging services. Uh, thank you for that. And Corey, let me just reinforce that you have family and friends and faculty who are rooting for you and definitely congratulating you um, throughout this presentation. Uh, another question, and I'll put a little spin on it, um, because the person who asked the question really is focusing on as a patient of, uh, who is a person of color, basically advocating for themselves. So if they, if they are a person of color who is a patient, uh, but they don't, and they're um, their primary care provider is not a person of color, and they feel that they their needs are not being met. Are there any suggestions you would give them to be a better advocate for themselves? Yeah, that's um that's an interesting question. Um, 
you know, I, I would like to, to think that, that with opportunities such as this, uh, physicians are becoming more aware of the role that race plays in the physician patient relationship. Uh, and so optimistically, I would say that having that open discussion with their physician, regardless of their race, um, would be important. And analyzing kind of where that and how that physician feels. Um, perhaps it's just a conversation that the two of them need to have in order to sort of further deepen that relationship uh, in order to, you know, uh, strengthen that, that trusting bond between physician and patient. Um, and so I think that'd be the first step, you know, see, see where the physician is at, see how they're feeling. And from there, if, if, if you didn't get the answer that you were looking for, or if you're still not feeling great, then, you know, I, I, I empower patients to take control of their health. Um, and so perhaps, looking into a community resource or even another physician that you might vibe better with. I think that's completely appropriate. Yeah, thank you for that, Corey. I would just add kind of to the, your latter point, um, regardless of what someone's race and ethnicity is, you know, if they feel like their concerns are not necessarily being t taken seriously, um, um, you always have an option for a second opinion or another opinion. Uh, so that, you know, that is something to definitely pursue. So thank you for that. Um, Janice asks, through your research and experience, have you found the same disparities in other areas such as advanced practice nursing or pharmacists or physical therapists, for example? So, so there's certainly a lack of diversity in those areas. And um, Heads Up has, has done our best to collaborate with the School of Nursing, uh, School of Dentistry, in, in order to bring them in for workshops for, for our youth as well. Um, and the kids, they, they loved it, you know, just as much. Um, I cannot speak from a research perspective as to the numbers um, or, or any sort of initiatives that exist in those, in those colleges um, or in those communities. Uh, but, but I do know that, 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 the, that there are health disparities, there are racial disparities amongst providers. And so um, I would assume that the same thing we see in medicine could be applied to those specialties, yes. And Chelsea asks, um, it, are there plans to extend Heads Up to rural communities? Um, what about even adults who live in underserved communities? Yeah, um, great question. Um, I think that, so a two-part question. I think that Heads Up will continue to focus on youth populations. Um, in, it, in its essence. That being said, we are beginning uh, to, to be in talks with, with um, high schools in the area to see uh, about potential programming ideas for a little bit older students uh, getting into like the 16 to 18 range. Um, and, and that's sort of the extent of where we feel most comfortable. Um, but as I continue my career, I do hope to use the skills gained uh, with Heads Up to apply them to other scenarios, because you're absolutely right. Our rural communities uh, experience health disparities in very similar ways to our urban uh, minority communities. And so I think that that, that would be a future uh, project that I, would, that I would really enjoy working on as far as access. Again, radiologic services in rural communities, it, it's, a, it's a big problem as well. Um, and as far as adults, um, you know, my, my passion is, is educating youth and these youth will become adults. Um, but as far as, as far as, um, educational opportunities, I don't, I don't see that as my lane. It's not where I want to focus, but I think the opportunity is there. Thank you. Uh, Michael asks, specific to the youth who are involved in Heads Up, any insight into barriers that they experience in their pursuit for a career in medicine and healthcare? So I think that the number one barrier that exists for many of these children is the fact that they have never been exposed to anything close to this. They do not believe that they can become doctors or physicians because they've never seen a, a physician who looks like them 
And so it is impossible for them to dream about this if, if they, they, it's not even conscious to them, it's not even a possibility. And so I think that is the number one barrier. Uh, but that being said, um, specifically with, with the, the ETSS youth, there, there are a variety of barriers that exist, uh, be it um, you know, unequal access to, to education uh, and, and health services, um, you know, the, the family dynamic that they have is, is much different than what we might think of as the, the normal uh, American family dynamic. And so, you know, I think that they, they have a, an identity problem trying to figure out how they identify as, is it an American, is it an Ethiopian American, is it an Ethiopian? And, and sort of working through that can, can be challenging. Uh, and, and with all the focus on, on figuring out yourself, it's kind of hard to, to figure out what I wanna do in 20 years. Uh, and so they, they do experience different challenges than, than you might expect the, the everyday youth uh, or, or the quote unquote American youth to, to experience. Um, but, but that being said, I think that um, through programs like this, that, that these children will realize that a lot of their barriers, uh, while there certainly are structural barriers, uh, a lot of their barriers are, are internal as well and, th and that they can do this with the proper mentoring, uh, with the with reallocation of resources. I, I think that I think that they can do it. Corey, thank you for that. You know, we're getting close to the end of time and I'll pose one more question. It's probably quite fitting that this last question will come from Dr. Quinn Capers, uh, who I know has also been a source of inspiration and a mentor uh, for you. Uh, and then we'll hand it over back to Bryce. Uh, to close this out. Dr. Caper says, is there a role for social media in encouraging young people to, per per to pursue medicine in educating, mentoring, and encouraging minority medical students and residents? And uh, after, after that, I'll, while, while you meditate on or think on that, I'll say that there are numerous other questions in here, Corey, and a lot of praise as well. Perhaps um, Bryce or Christina can collate these for you to be able to see at a later time. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Gray, uh, for everything. Um, Dr. Capers, yes, yes and yes. Uh, I think social media is an amazing tool if used correctly uh, in encouraging the youth. Um, you know, we have to meet them on their level. They have to think that not only is this something that they can achieve, but this is pretty cool. Um, you know, I, I like doing this or, or they look like they're enjoying themselves uh, doing this. And so I think that social media really hits home for them when we see, um, be it be it our Black Men in Medicine roundtable events, or, or be it uh, Dr. Jason Campbell uh, dancing on, on TikTok. You know, there, there are ways in which um, we do things that relate to them. And so I think that finding each, each and every one of our paths and sort of um, using social media to shine a light uh, is, is incredibly important uh, for, for them. So I really, and I, I've done it time and time again, but I really encourage uh, my, the first and second year kind of mentees that I have to get on social media, to show people the cool things you are doing. Not only uh, will, will you be able to reach upward and, and meet residents or attendings who are interested in the same thing, but you'll be able to reach down and connect with with uh, the youth, uh, other pre-medical students, high school students who, who want to be like you. And so uh, social media sort of give them, gives them a little bit of access uh, to that. So, so yes, I do think that it plays an important role. Thank you again. Uh, outstanding presentation. Uh, um, I'm sure the entire fan club, and I'll check with the fan club later, I'm sure they're exceedingly proud um, and, and I'll be sure to touch base with your mother as well. And I'm, I'm sure she's watching too. Um, yeah, Bryce? Out there. <laughs> yes, thank you all. Um, outstanding presentation, Corey. And I really want to thank, um, thank you for all the time that you've put into this and for uh, leading us in this very first uh, medical student grand rounds. I know that uh, being the first person to do something isn't always easy, and I think you really set the bar high, so thank you. Uh, thank you to Dr. Gray for being here as well um, to help moderate and lead the discussion. Um, also want to take an opportunity to remind everyone that that QR code there, 
uh, gives all the feedback, gives us feedback on how we can improve this session. Um, it also has um, some specific feedback specifically that Corey asked for. So I please, please uh, go ahead and use that QR code to give us feedback. Uh, finally, I wanna thank uh, Christina Witcher as well for uh, figuring out the whole webinar uh, platform and uh, making this run as smoothly as it did. I couldn't have done it without her. And just to close, just a reminder that in two weeks from now, uh, we will be having another medical student grand rounds um, from Monir Abujud talking about uh, combating stigmatization of men's health issues. Um, so I asked for all everyone who's still watching to um, tune in for that. Um,